This is Duke University. I'd like to tell you about a research project on corporate culture that I've been working on with Cam Harvey and Jill Papadak from Duke and Shiva Rajgopal from Columbia University. This project's been supported by the Cole Center here at Fuqua and by CFO Magazine. Now, if you read the headlines, you see corporate culture often gets blamed or gets credit for dramatic corporate events. So for example, the VW emission scandal and recent events at Wells Fargo, we read about corporate culture leading to maybe a bad outcome. With Google, corporate culture gets at least some of the credit for Google having such a fantastic and successful company. So corporate culture is everywhere, and I have to admit I approached this research project as a bit of a skeptic. What exactly is this corporate culture? Is it really as important as these headlines say it is? And if it is, how does it work? These are questions that I wanted to answer and our research team wanted to try to answer. So what we did is we went out and surveyed 1,900 CEOs and CFOs from around the globe to ask them about corporate culture, what they think of it, how it works at their companies. We also interviewed companies one-on-one, -on -one, executives from companies one-on-one -on -one that represent the 20% of the market capitalization of the, the U.S. stock exchanges. So we had quite a, a large number of companies and a lot of depth and importance of those companies. Now, it took 50 MBA students as research assistants to help us pull this off. We're really thankful for that help, and we couldn't have done it without them. All right, first question, is corporate culture important? Yes, executives tell us resoundingly corporate culture is very important and it affects many parts of the company. So we, we went about trying to address this in two different ways. One was we gave executives a long list of possible value drivers, things that create value at their companies, and we asked them to rank those items. And it turns out corporate culture came out on top, the biggest value driver at companies more important than the strategic plan, than the operating plan, more important than the CEO, and me, a finance professor, more important than the finance function of the company, okay? So corporate culture, very important, it came out on top, not just in the United States, but around the globe, in Africa, Europe, in Asia, in Latin America, we saw culture showing up as either number one or maybe a close second. So culture is very important. Second way we addressed this, where we just straight on asked, how important is corporate culture at your firm? And here, about 90% of executives told us culture is either important or very important, and most of them said very important. So we've established then that corporate culture is very important. The next question is, what is it? Okay, what exactly is corporate culture? So remember I told you we interviewed a lot of executives, and here's a couple interview quotes I'd like to give you to give you a sense of what culture is. I'll paraphrase. The first is that corporate culture is like the tendons in our body. The tendons hold together the muscle and the bone, and they let our muscle and bone and body do the work it's intended to do in a healthy and productive way. Okay? Like that, culture is what helps the company reach its potential. Okay? Holds the company together, if you will. Another example is an example of an orchestra. Corporate culture is like sheet music. You can hire the best trumpet player, the best violinist, and if they're not playing on the same sheet music, you won't get a very good outcome. But if you have the culture, if you have that sheet music, and they're playing on the same tempo, with same cadence, then you can have a wonderful outcome. Likewise, the culture is what helps a company reach its potential and helps the employees march together. So those interviews give us a nice idea of what culture is. But like true academics, we want to put more structure on it. We want a little framework, a little model, if you will. So we relied on existing uh, research and kind of built on that. And what existing research says is there's kind of two ways you could break down a company. One part is the formal institutions, okay? And these formal institutions are things you could write down, the governance of the company, the compensation policies, the hiring and firing practices, you know, kind of tangible things. Those are important. People have done a lot of research on them. We're not researching them so much in this paper. On the other side, you have the, the informal aspects that we call corporate culture. And culture has really two main components, the values and the norms, okay? A little lingo. 
But the values, they're sort of like the Ten Commandments. They're chiseled on, on stone. They're the things we aspire to, that we'd like to, to achieve, okay? But the norms are actually the day-to-day -day living as we strive to reach those values, okay? And one of the main contributions of our paper, in the academic sense at least, is to, to kind of provide evidence that these norms are very, very important, the day-to-day -day living of the values. In fact, we're one of the few papers to focus on norms, and our conclusion is without the norms, the values and these other things don't matter very much, okay? You can look at a recent editorial by the former CEO of IBM and the, the editorials in the Wall Street Journal, and he says something very similar. Values, you look along, along websites, you see very similar values across companies, but the norms, where the, you know, where the feet hit the ground, if you will, the living out of the values, is, the norms, that is, is really what matters, okay? So how does culture work? You need to have values, norms, and these formal things, the compensation policy, for example, working together and reinforcing each other to actually achieve an effective corporate culture, okay? So you need all of these aligned. Now, a little more detail, how does culture work? What we wouldn't want to do is think, oh, if I get a good culture, I'll get a good outcome. What we'd rather have you think of it as really a two-step process. The second step is, if I have an effective culture, I get the desired outcome. But the first step, and the one that we're really more focused on is, what do we need to do to achieve that effective culture? And here it's really, again, the norms, the values, and these, these formal aspects like the compensation policy and governance have to all work together to give you an effective culture. And this is what we think companies should focus on a lot, is what it takes to get an effective culture. What are some of the outcomes from having an effective culture, all right? Or an ineffective culture as it might be. I'm going to talk about four things briefly. If you look in the research paper, there's probably a dozen more outcomes you could, you could talk about, we could talk about. One is investment risk. We just lived through a financial crisis, a deep depression, a deep recession, excuse me. And what we've noticed is some companies seem to take on too much risk, okay? Now, um, what, what the executives at these companies tell us is that having a bad culture is what leads to companies taking on too much risk. A little surprising to us, a number of companies told us their companies take on too little risk. They're too satisfied with the status quo. And again, it's the culture isn't quite right to encourage the company to take on entrepreneurial risk. So bottom line here on, on investment risk is if you have an effective culture, you take the appropriate amount of investment risk. All right, ethics. 85% of executives tell us that when the culture is not right, it can lead to unethical or even illegal actions by employees. So it's not just the headlines that we read about, it's actually 85% of executives saying they need to get the culture right at their company or things could go sour, okay? Third, short-term versus long-term. Sometimes it's said that in the United States, companies focus too much on the short term and they should focus more on the long term. Again, executives tell us that when they have the bad outcome, focus too much on the short term, that's because the culture's not working right. When they have the good outcome focusing on the long term, it's because the culture is working right. They have an effective culture. And then finally, let me give you a more specific example, mergers and acquisitions, okay? A very important investment decision, if you will. So here we ask, if, if your company has a target company in mind and it's very aligned on the operational side and it's exact, do, the target's doing just what you want it to do to, to acquire it and bring it into your company, but the culture is not properly aligned, so you have a misaligned culture, when that happens, we wanted to ask executives, well, how much of a discount would you require to, to acquire that target? And that will give us a sense of just how important culture is. So misaligned culture, how much would that reduce the price you're willing to pay? And we thought we'd hear maybe 15%, 20%. In fact, the main thing we heard is most companies wouldn't pursue an acquisition at all if the culture is misaligned. So that kind of tells us just how important culture is in general, but also in the M&A context, how important it is to align the cultures before you proceed. All right. 
let me give you a little more detail here on, on, some, of the, on some of the statistical stuff we did. So, so far I've been a pretty high level. So we ran regressions where we tried to explain how does a company get an effective corporate culture that would lead to creativity, okay? So let's think of creativity or innovation, you might call it, all right? Well, the value that is going to lead to creativity is adaptability. So a company that has a value where it can react as, as times change and as the environment changes, that's a value that leads to creativity. But as we said before, it's not just the value that matters, it's also the norms, all right? So what are the norms that lead to creativity? It's developing new ideas organically within your company and the employees having comfort in offering and receiving critiques. If that's the work environment you have on a day-to-day -day basis, where you are developing new ideas organically and giving and accepting critiques, that's the environment that leads to creativity. Now, interestingly, there's another value that was listed but had a negative effect on creativity. When a company is really results-driven, results-oriented, maybe too focused on the bottom line, that does not lead to creativity. It actually hurts it. All right, second example, ethics. What value leads to ethical behavior? Well, integrity is, is such a value. That sounds wonderful, but what are the norms that are required, the day-to-day -day living that is required in order to achieve that, that value and to achieve good ethical behavior? Here, trust among employees is the most important norm and also willingness of the employees to report unethical behavior. So if you have that happening in your work environment, you get the good positive ethical outcomes that you desire. Now there's a lot more detail in the paper that you can, you can look at if you want. I'm just trying to give you a sampling today. All right, to summarize so far, corporate culture is first order important. We think a culture is being made up of values and norms. The norms are the day-to-day -day living of those values. And we think of it in a two-step process where the values and norms working together along with other things like compensation policy give you an effective culture which give you the outcomes. So that all sounds, sounds all nice, but do all companies have effective cultures? If it's that easy, does everyone achieve it? No, they don't. About 15% of companies tell us they have their culture right where they want it. The rest don't. And in fact, about a third of companies tell us there's a, they need to have a considerable work or a substantial overhaul to get their culture to where they need it to be. So about a third of companies say they have a lot of work to do. How do you improve your corporate culture? All right, it starts with leadership. The leaders must define the culture and they must live those, those corporate and cultural values. We're not talking about the board of directors. The board of directors hires the CEO but the CEO and the leadership team are the ones that instill that corporate culture into the company. Now, it's very important that the culture permeate the mid-level management and the rank-and-file employees also, or of course it's not going to succeed. So we need employees of all levels to buy in and to live the culture on a day-to-day -day basis. Second point, the company must invest in corporate culture, okay? They must dedicate time and resources to instill and to reinforce the culture at the company. So this involves recognizing when employees act in a way that's in accordance with the culture, celebrating those, those achievements, and even having promotional and hiring decisions based on the, achieving the culture of the firm. And finally, this is a continuous long-term commitment by the company. This is not something you achieve in a weekend retreat somewhere. This has to be happening week after week at the company to really get the culture to where you need it to be. So, I, I told you at the beginning I started as a skeptic. Well, our research team has concluded that culture is, in fact, very important, and I hope I've been able to convey to you some of the ways that culture works at the firm. We've got two research papers out there that you can look up if you want more details. The first paper has a lot of the statistical analysis and survey results. The second focuses on the interviews.